Hi everyone, welcome to Code Curly. My name is Sandeep. In this video, we will be looking at a very common design interview problem which has been asked by a lot of companies lately. Uh, so let's look at how do we design a hotel booking system, something very similar to Booking.com or Airbnb. But just one thing to call out, we will be looking at a very high level architecture of the whole system and not at a low level class diagram and all of that in this video. So before we jump into the problem, let's first look at the functional requirements. Then we look at the non-functional requirements of what we want to achieve and then we look at the design. So we have two major consumers of this application. One is the hotel side of user and then there are the consumers who want to book the hotel. So for the hotel managers, we'll have these three major functionalities. One is they should be able to onboard onto our platform. They should be able to update their property. So for example, they might want to add a new room, they might want to change the pricing, they might want to add new images and stuff like that. Then they should be able to see what all bookings are there and along with that also get some insight into their revenue numbers and all of that. Okay. From a user standpoint, they should be able to search for a property in a particular location with a couple of search criteria. So for example, they might want to filter within a price range or some aspects of the property like a five star property or a beach rent property and stuff like that. Then they should be able to book that hotel. And once they have booked, they should be able to look at their booking. Okay. These are the major requirements. Now we should also design it in a way that we leave scope for some kind of analytics to be done. Okay. So these are the functional side of things. From a non-functional side of things, we need this platform to be uh, to run at a very low latency and it should give a very high availability and a very high consistency. By high consistency, I mean if you are booking a hotel, if a user is booking a hotel, he should be able to see that hotel immediately. Okay. Now from a scale standpoint, what kind of scale do we want? So a quick Google search tells me that there are roughly 500,000 hotels in the whole world at this point in time. There are roughly 10, 12 million rooms in all the hotels across the world at this point in time. And roughly there are, if you can assume that there are 1000 rooms in a particular hotel in general. So there are some hotels who have, which have more than 7,000 rooms at this point in time, but those are some edge cases. We should be able to handle that. The reason I'm talking about this thousand number is, so let's say a hotel has thousand rooms. Now these rooms will be booked over a course of many days. So there would never be a situation that there is just one room available and there are thousands of users who are wanting to book that. At max what will happen is there is one room and there are two, three users who are trying to book that. And we'll be able to use that assumption for our leverage at later point in time. Now let's look at the overall design of the whole system and how the data flows within each component. Then we look individually into some of the components. Okay, so the whole business flow starts at this point, uh, which is basically a UI that we give out to the hotel manager. Through this, U it could be either a website or a mobile app. But through this UI, they would come on onboard onto our platform, and the same UI would be used by them to modify the property. So let's say they want to add a new image, or they want to add a new room, or if they want to make any modification, this is the UI that they talk to. Now this UI talks to a load balancer through which it's, it talks to a hotel service. This is basically a service which manages the hotel part, which is basically the onboarding and the management. All right. Now let's just say there's a spike in traffic. So there could be multiple nodes of this hotel services that could be added here. And so this becomes a horizontally scalable component. Now hotel data in itself is a very much relational data. Thus earlier we talked about the number of hotels. That's not too many. So it doesn't even have a scale problem. So we'll be using a clustered MySQL here with one master and multiple slaves. Slaves can be added as and when required. If let's say there's a huge spike in read traffic, we can add more slaves. But this data resides within MySQL database. Okay. Now let's just say any image is added. So hotels can add images about their rooms, about their whole building and all of that. All those images would be stored into a CDN. And the reference to the CDN, which is basically a URL of the image, would be stored in the database. And that URL would be sent out to customers. And whenever they want to render an image, that would be looked up directly from the CDN. Now, what is a CDN? It's basically a geographically distributed uh, data store, which we'll be using for sending out images throughout the whole world. So let's just say I'm connecting from India. Somebody is connecting from US. They want to look up for an image of a particular hotel. So I'll look up on the CDN server, which is in India. The other person will look up into the CDN server, which is in US. Okay. So this becomes the hotel life cycle management. The next thing is basically, uh, let's just say each time a modification is happening to a hotel. Let's just say a new hotel comes in. We want to 
bubble up this hotel to the users who are going to search for this right now there are multiple ways in which we can send out this information to the search piece right i'll be using a kafka here so each modification that is happening within hotel service will flow through a kafka cluster and there'll be multiple consumers that will be sitting on top of this cluster which will populate their data store for serving the search traffic and for other traffic as well right so one of the consumers will be the search consumer what happens is let's say a hotel gets a new room for example right there will be a payload that is put into kafka which has all the information that is required right now the search consumer pop, pulls up the payload from kafka and it stores into its own database and this database would be used to power the search on the website okay now for search i am using a elastic search here uh elastic search is basically a database that is built on lucene platform similar instead of elastic search you could also use a solar hair both are kind of similar components ideally it would depend on what infrastructure is being used in your company you could use that right but the idea of using elastic search is that i want this piece to be supporting fuzzy search now let's just say i am searching for a hotel in maldives or let's say user is searching for a hotel in maldives the user might not know the correct spelling right uh, if they type in a wrong word i don't want them to get no results i would want this to be able to support a fuzzy search so i have to be able to handle all the typos and spelling mistakes and all of that plus i also want to give similar similarity kind of a thing there so that's the reason i'm using a elastic search so all the data of each individual hotel flows through the kafka via the search consumer into this elastic search cluster okay now on top of this elastic search sits the search service now again let's just say there is a spike in traffic i can increase the number of nodes in kafka cluster i can increase the number of search consumers here and i can increase the number of nodes in elastic search cluster so till now whatever we have talked about is again horizontally scalable right and again coming to search service this is the service which powers the search on the website now website is i'm using a generic term sometimes i'll use a website sometimes i'll say ui but it's basically all modes of communication through which a user can come in that could be a app that could be a website right so the user talks to through again a load balancer to the search service whenever they want to search for a particular hotel again they will give a date range and a location for example as a search criteria and along with that they could also provide some tag now that tags would be the properties of the hotel so again going back to my previous example a five star property is a tag a beach front property is a tag now the search on elastic search would be happening on either of these tags and the ranges that are provided basically the date range price range and all of that okay so this takes care of the search flow now once the user has seen some of the results on the website they would want to book a hotel right the booking again happens through this ui so i've made this ui um, saying that it's a search and book ui normally it will be the same app or the same website so which they are searching and then booking right now booking ui a uh, booking request again comes to this load balancer and talks to booking service booking service essentially again sits on top of a mysql database now these are two different mysql clusters i am purposefully not using a same cluster here although we could use a same cluster and have two different databases in that but because we are talking about a fairly large system that has like a good enough amount of scale i would want to keep different clusters so as to you know take care of the scaling separately of each other okay now this sir whenever a booking happens that booking gets stored into this mysql we'll go over the exact flow of booking when we go over the details of implementation within the booking service but essentially this stores the data into this mysql and it talks to a payment service normally what will happen it will a booking request will come it will store something it will send the request for payment once there is a success it will mark the booking confirm right uh, now again whenever a booking is happening the data is flowing into the same kafka right why so let's just say there was just one room available in a hotel right and that room is now booked i want to make sure that this hotel is not available for search now in that same date range because it's not available right so all of those information is again sent to the same kafka which is read by search consumer and then it takes care of even removing the hotels which are now completely booked now if you can see there's something called an archival service here uh, what i have done is 
I'm just storing the live data into my SQL. By live data, I mean the bookings that are done, but have not been completed. Thereby making sure that this is having a scale which is low enough that my SQL can easily handle. And once a booking moves to a terminal state, so let's say a booking is cancelled or booking is completed, it will move through the archival service to a Cassandra cluster. The reason I'm using a Cassandra here is, so Cassandra is a fairly good database which can handle a huge amount of reads and writes. Okay, it has a constraint that it needs a partition key on which all the queries should happen. So let's say if I want to search by a booking ID, my partition key has to be a booking ID in that case. I cannot do any kinds of queries on a Cassandra. Therefore, I did not use a Cassandra as the source of root database because on this database, I need to do a large variety of queries. We'll come to all of those when we look, go into the detail of booking service. But once it is archived, we just need to do gets on those. So therefore, Cassandra makes a good enough sense over here. Now, once the booking is done, all of that is fine. But now we need to notify all the people, right? So then comes the notification service. So let's say uh, whenever a booking is made or any changes are happening into a booking or it moves into a terminal state, there will be a notification service that consumes events from this Kafka and notifies the people. So for example, on each booking, we need to notify the hotel, right? Whenever a booking is canceled by the hotel, we need to notify the consumer. Or in fact, on each booking, we need to notify the consumer with an invoice, right? So all of those is taken care by this notification service. Cool. Now coming back to the UI for hotels and users. So each time a booking is done, or even without that, a user might want to see their old bookings, or a hotel might want to see all the bookings that they have. This is more of a read-only view for them, right? That will be powered by this booking management service, which talks to now two data sources. It talks to the MySQL cluster for all the active bookings, which are to happen sometime in future, and to the Cassandra cluster for the bookings that have already happened, right? Now I'm adding a Redis on top of this MySQL to reduce the load on this MySQL. So Redis will act as my cache and whenever I have a query, so for example, something like get bookings of a user, so I can cache this result into this Redis and it will be a write through cache. So whenever a new booking is coming in, this will get updated. All right. Now this is the functional flow. The bigger component here is how do we do the analytics on this? So let's just say a business person wants to know how much revenue I'm making or how many bookings I'm having, or what are my best performing hotels and stuff like that. So they need to do a lot of analytics. Now, mostly while designing the system, we'll never always know what kind of analytics is required, right? So what I've done for that is, I've used a Hadoop cluster on which I'm pushing in all the events that are going into my Kafka, which is basically information about all my hotels, about all my bookings, about all the transactions that happen in, in my system, right? So there'll be a Spark streaming consumer that runs somewhere that reads from this Kafka and puts all the data into my Hadoop cluster on which I can do hive queries or any different kind of queries and build up a lot of reporting. Right? So this is overall how the system look like, looks like and how the data flows. Now let's go into de details of some of the components. Now let's look at what hotel service internally is. So it's not a very complicated service. It is basically a CRUD service which provides create, update, read, delete operations on the hotel data store. And it is the source of truth for hotel data. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of neither the APIs nor the DB schema that you see here. There will be a lot more things, but this will give you a feel of how it should be. Okay. So let's look at some of the APIs. There will be a post API slash hotels to create a hotel, which will be part of their onboarding process. Um, there will be a get API with an ID slash hotel slash hotel ID, which will give back the information of the hotel, which can be rendered on the screen and the hotel guy can see it. Now there will be a put API slash hotel slash ID, which will be used to update any information of a hotel. Similarly, there will be a put API slash hotel slash hotel ID slash room slash room ID, which would be used to update the room information or create new rooms and all of that. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There will be a lot more API than you can add it as and when, you know, there is a requirement to add. Now, let's look at how the DB schema might look like. So, there are a couple of important tables. Now, this is again not an exhaustive list of database of the tables. So, there is one hotel table into this hotel DB. But before that, everything in red here is either a primary key or a foreign key. Everything in blue is just a column. Okay. 
Uh, now this hotel table contains your very standard things: ID, name, locality ID, which is a foreign key into locality table, description, original images, display images, and is active. Now I have two columns for original and display images. So original images is basically what the the artifact that the people have uploaded. Display images could be a compressed version of that that we've compressed. It could be a version that we have uploaded on the CDN. It could be uh, something different than the original image. But we still need to keep both of them, so we have stored it there. His active is basically a like a delete plan. Okay. Then coming to rooms table, it has a room ID, obviously a hotel ID which references into this table, a display name which could just be a identifier to tell the customer on what kind of a room it is, is active against a, again a delete flag. Quantity basically tells how many such rooms are there in the hotel and a price min and a price max. Now why do we have, do we have two prices? Remember the Hadoop cluster that we had in the original design that we made? It has all a lot of data about various kinds of things. We might as well run a machine learning model onto it and do some supply demand analytics and then come up with the optimal price, right? Let's say supply is um, low, there's a lot of demand, there are just a few rooms left, might as well increase the price. Or let's say if there are too many rooms and very few customers, might as well reduce the price, right? So this price min and price max could be the ranges which the hotel provides, wherein the price could be fluctuated by the system. A good starting point could be an average of both these prices, right? Then there's a facilities table, which is basically uh, a list of all the facilities that a hotel and a room can possibly have. And these hotel facilities and room facilities are basically a mapping table, which is a many-to-many -many relationship between a hotel ID and a facility ID. Uh, again, is active flag everywhere is basically a delete flag. Now, again, this is not a full list of tables. There are a lot of information missing. I've skipped the auditing information. I've skipped bookkeeping information, like graded on updated time and all of that. A lot of information missing, but this will give you a fair enough idea and it will be a good starting point for you to uh, come up with a DB schema for this. One more thing to note here that if you remember the original design that we had, I did not keep a Redis cache on top of this MySQL database, but I did keep a Redis cache on the other MySQL database which was for booking table. Now why is that? We could have kept the a cache on top of this and all these get APIs could have been a bit more faster. Right, but this is not coming in the critical path of any high throughput business interaction, right? So all the customers are not querying this database, neither the this service. They are always querying the search service. So if this service is a little bit slow, that's okay. But adding a Redis cluster is a cost. So you need to do a trade-off analysis between what cost are you adding of an infrastructure and what benefit it adds to you. If it is worth it, you might as well go and add a Redis cluster here. But I don't think it is worth it and that's the reason I did not add it. Now let's look at the internal functioning of the booking service. We'll first start off just walking through the DB schema. Again, it's not a full-fledged schema. There are a lot of details missing like bookkeeping information like created time, updated time and all of that. But let's focus on the meaty part here. Okay, so it has a table called available room, which has a room ID, it has a date, it has an initial quantity that comes from the uh, hotel service and it has an available quantity. Available quantity is basically the number of rooms that are remaining for that particular room ID for that particular date. Okay. Now, it has a constraint saying it cannot go negative. Here is where the true power of MySQL we are utilizing and that's the reason why I chose to use MySQL here. Okay. The other table here is a booking table. Uh, it has a booking ID which is the prime DK here. Uh, which will be referenced across the whole system. It has a room ID, again comes from the room table. It has a user ID, a start date and an end date for a particular booking. Number of rooms, which is how many rooms the person has booked, status and an invoice ID. Okay, now looking at this design, we can clearly understand that one booking cannot contain uh, different room types. You can have multiple rooms of the same room type, but you cannot have like one deluxe room and one regular room in one booking. If you want that, there'll be a small change required, but I think that's a minor detail. It can be taken care of easily. Okay. The important part here is the status column. It has these four values, reserved, booked, canceled, and completed. 
now cancelled and completed are the terminal statuses here. Uh, so the booking gets first created into reserved status. Then when based on the payment success, it can either move to booked or cancelled. And once the user stays in that, it moves to completed. Now you can add more statuses depending upon your conversation with your interviewer. But these four statuses are the main ones that will help us achieve what we initially thought of. Okay. Now let's look at the API signature. So this will have one important API called a book API. It will be a post API which will take these five attributes. It will contain a user ID. It will contain a room ID. It will contain the quantity. Now again, if we want to make multiple rooms, multiple quantity, we'll have to change it a bit to have an array. But let's stick to this for now. It will have a start date and it will have an end date. The price will come from somewhere else, let's assume for now. It will actually come from the data store which contains the price for the room at this point in time. We don't want to generally take the price from the user because then the request can be tampered with and that's not really a good design. Okay. Now let's do a quick revision of the design because I skipped some important details in the earlier larger diagram and we'll go over that now. So the way booking service actually works is when it gets a request to do a booking, it first of all queries this table and uh, the available rooms table and checks whether or not I have that many number of rooms remaining or not. So if there are no rooms left for that particular room ID for that particular day, there's no point of proceeding. So we can error out on that. But in case that's a success and we have rooms, then we actually go ahead with the blocking of the room. Saying that now I'll block it temporarily and if the payment is success, I'll actually book the room. I'll do a quick dry run of what actually happens. Assuming this is the request that came in, user ID 1, room ID 5, quantity 1, for some date DT to DT plus 1. Okay. The room ID 5 on that particular date DT has 7 available rooms. So our first check is a success that we have enough room. So what essentially will happen is there will be a row created in this table with a booking ID, some UUID, room ID 5, user ID is 1, start date is DT, whatever that is, end date would be DT plus 1, whatever that is, number of rooms in the request is quantity is 1, okay. and status would be at this point in time reserved. Okay, invoice ID at this point in time would be null because there is no invoice created at till now. Okay. Now we have a record. Okay, along with that we also decrement the quantity here. Now here again we are utilizing a very important feature of MySQL which is the asset prop part of the asset property and transactions. Okay, so we are creating a record here and we are re reducing the quantity here to 6. What essentially we are trying to do is basically bounding this as part of one transaction. So let's say if there was just one room left and two, three requests came in, only one transaction would be successful to do both these things. Basically insert this record and reduce the quantity because we have this constraint sitting over here which says that quantity cannot be negative. Okay, so only one of the transaction will be success and only one of the rooms will be booked and no two users will be redirected to payment. Okay, now that being taken care of, what is the next step? So I have written down the steps here if you want to actually look at. So what we have gone through till now is step number one and step number two. Okay, we have inserted in booking and reduced the, reduced the quantity in available room. Our step number three is something that I did not cover as part of the larger design review because it was getting too much cluttered. Now we cannot keep this room reserved for an infinite amount of time. What we can say is if the payment is success in next five minutes, well and good. If not, then we'll assume that the payment will not go through and we'll unblock the room so that somebody else could book it. Okay, so there are multiple ways to implement that. What I choose to implement here is something using the time to live of Redis. Okay, so because we anyway are using a Redis, we can utilize the same cluster of Redis for this use case as well. So what we'll do is, we'll put the key in Redis saying some booking ID expires at some timestamp. Now the timestamp could be a configurable number. It could be a fixed timestamp across the board. It could be a country specific time thing for India have a time expiry time of five minutes for US have expiry time of four minutes, something of that sort. But whatever that time is, we'll insert that into Redis. Now what Redis does is it has something called callbacks. 
So one of the later versions of Redis has introduced this concept called callback. So whenever a key is getting expired, you'll get a notification. Okay. And you can do whatever you need to do at that point in time. Right. So if the if you get a success notification from payment, well and good. Uh, success notification means the payment has gone through. Then you'll mark the booking as booked. But before that, if you get a callback from Redis, saying that the key has expired and you've not got the success from payment, you'll say that the booking is cancelled, right? Alternatively, you could also get a failure from payment saying for whatever reason, the payment didn't go through and you got a failure re response from the payment service. In that, again, you can say cancel, right? Now, if you want a bifurcation of the varieties of cancel, you can maybe make multiple events, like cancel because of invoicing, cancel because of payment, cancel because of expiry, whatever, right? Or you could maybe add a status reason column, something of that sort. But that's a very minute detail. We'll skip that for now. Okay. So let's go over what all possibilities are there in this and how each of them behaves. Okay. So first very simple thing is what happens when payment is a success. So in case payment is a success, everything remains the same. Just the status becomes booked. Okay. In that case, we do get some invoice ID as well. Okay. So basically we'll create, we'll get an invoice ID from payment service whenever, uh, you know, a booking is getting success and we'll just update the invoice ID there. And then the regular Kafka events would also be sent saying the booking is now complete and here's the Kafka event for that in case somebody wants to do something on that. Okay. What happens when payment fails? Now in this, we just have these four statuses. So the booking status will become canceled. Okay, there would be no invoice ID in this case, right? Because if the payment did not go through, there obviously is not an invoice that is generated. So, and everything else remains the same. But if the payment did not go through, we need to revert the available quantity again. So available quantity in that case would become seven. Okay, now let's say your key expired. So basically, let's say the user was redirected to payment screen and there was no response from payment service for whatever reason. What happens then is we get a callback from Redis and based on that callback, we can say that, okay, now the payment has not gone through. We'll follow the same process as payment failure. We'll mark this cancelled. Okay, we'll mark this cancelled and we'll increment the quantity in available quantity so that the room is now available for somebody else to use. Again, in that scenario, there is no invoice generated. Okay, but this you do only if the status is reserved. Why? Coming to the next case. What happens if both three and one happen? What happens if you get a key expiry event and a payment is also successful? So there are two conditions. If the payment has already been successful and the booking has already been mo moved to book status, after that, if you get the key expired event, then you don't do anything because that is anyway bound to happen, right? Uh, but what if it happens the other way around? What if key expired first, you move the booking to cancel state, but then you get a notification saying payment is success, right? Now, there, there are multiple directions in which you could take it based on your conversation with your interviewer and the non-functional requirements. And in fact, even the functional requirements for that matter. You could do two, three things. You could now either revert the payment saying for whatever reason we were not able to book the room. So here's your payment back. Alternatively, you could do something even more smarter. You could say that now I've anyway got the payment from the user. I'll check if there are rooms available and I'll book them, right? Now this could be done based on what the requirement is and you could talk to your interviewer and implement it either way. Okay. And now all good so far, but there are a couple of caveats here. The TTL that you've talked about, it is not a very precise measure. So let's just say that a key was supposed to expire at 10.00. Okay. You will not, you will probably never ever get a callback at this point in time. It will always have some delay. Now in this case, it doesn't matter too much. Instead of at 10.00, if you get it at 10 hours and 1 minute, it's possibly okay also. So it's not big of too big of a problem. And the reason for that is because of the way expiries are implemented in Redis. I'll not go too much into detail of that, but there's a background process that runs into Redis for keys that are not accessed. 
and whenever that process gets to access a particular key is when it will expire it so it is not necessary that it will expire it at exactly the same time okay but let's say if you wanted it to be totally precise then you could possibly tweak the implementation a bit and do a slightly different way so instead of doing a ttl based approach you could in fact implement a queue within, within redis and have a polar that kind of queries redis the topmost node of the queue every one second and whichever one it it finds has expired then you could kind of delete that but that's not that's obviously much better but that comes at a cost so you'll have to build a kind of a polling mechanism so that's additional development effort and then it will be continuously bombarding redis every one second so there's a lot of cpu being utilized on both the sides on the cron side and on the redis side so possibly you'll have to add more nodes into the redis cluster and also on the side where cron is being developed so now that's a trade off do you want to be notified absolutely immediately when the keys are supposed to be expired and at the cost of additional hardware that trade off you can again make with the conversation with your interviewer but otherwise all of this being said i would still go with a ttl based approach because in this particular example it doesn't really matter so much now a couple of op optimizations you could do so let's just say payment is success you know that key will expire after some time for sure right because it's there in redis you don't need to keep that key there you know the payment is success you can evict the key right even if the for the payment failure case you know that payment has failed it will expire after 5 minutes might as well delete the key then and there right so these are certain optimizations that you could do over this implementation to make it even more better but on and off this is how the booking flow works now again reiterating we have used a couple of uh, important features of mysql and that's what is helping us to make the code on application side much more smoother had we used some other database which doesn't provide for example if you were using cassandra here we would not have had access to the transactions and the constraints and all of that we would have to implement it on application side that's additional effort on our side to make sure things are consistent in this case i would rather leave it to mysql to implement all of those things now coming back to the same architecture again i just want to call out that all of the components that you see here are individually horizontally scalable so let's just say there's a traffic spike happening on one of the components we could increase the number of nodes in that particular service maybe that particular database and then that should work just fine as far as kafka and hadoop cluster are concerned we could add more nodes into that as well and they should also scale to a much larger scale than what we need cool so now let's look at what kind of alternates that we could have used instead of this particular design choice right so first of all why mysql we could use any other relational database here we could use a postgres we could use a sql server anything which provides asset guarantees should be fairly fine here as far as redis is concerned we could use a memcached or any other cache instead of redis and that should also be as good okay uh, cassandra i would still stick to cassandra because that is exactly what we need here now technically in place of cassandra we could also use a hbase here that would also work fine but it has a lot of operational overhead in terms of deployment and maintaining it over time so that's the reason i would prefer cassandra over hbase or any other similar system the way cassandra works is every data in cassandra is uh, you know sharded across a partition key so each query has to happen on a partition key now the queries that we are doing are just of two varieties get bookings by hotel or get bookings by user there is no other third variety so we basically have two kinds of data which is distributed by two different partition keys on which the queries are happening so this would be kind of a very good choice here in place of kafka we could have used an active mq or a rabbit mq or any other queuing mechanism um there's an amazon queue also we could have used that but i think kafka scales much better than most of them so it, i think it's a fairly good choice here other than that in general we definitely need to monitor how are our, our cpus and memories behaving so if i have a cpu spike at certain points in time that is something we need to kind of look at so across the whole infrastructure we need to keep an eye on how my cpu usage percentage is how my memory usage percentage is how my disk usage for redis is how my disk usage for elastic search is all of these things are what we need to monitor now monitoring could be done through a grafana kind of a tool on which i can set up alerts so if the, let's say a particular metric has some threshold 
the moment I cross that threshold or with certain conditions, I could send out an alert and the team could get notified that something is potentially wrong and they need to look at that. This will help us to make sure that we in the end achieve our NFRs that we talked about of latency and high availability. Because let's just say something goes wrong. Let's just say memory is you know, utilized more than what we expected. Eventually, it will lead to some machines going down and eventually it will lead to us having a lower availability that, than what we expected. So yeah, these are the things that we need to monitor and alert on. Now in the next section, let's look at how this whole thing would be spread across geographies. So for example, let's say there's an earthquake in one of the data centers and everything just goes away out of the blue. What do we do? So let's look at that next. So let's say we have these four data centers, data center one, data center two, data center three, and data center four, which are located in different geographical regions across the globe. Okay, now we want to create a topology in a way that we do get low latency and high availability. Okay, so one very simple approach that we could do is say that DC1 is our primary and all the three DCs are our secondary data centers and data is replicated to all the three data centers in near real time. Okay, so that's okay, it's good enough but it's not very good to be honest because we are just using 25% of our capacity as primary which is active and rest three data centers are sitting idle and not really doing anything. Okay, so let's try to improvise. What we could instead do is divide the data centers and thus the globe into two parts. Okay, what we could say is this is region one and this is region two. Okay, now the countries or people accessing our services who are closer to this region will connect to this region and the people who are closer to that region will connect to that region. Right? Now, how are we able to do that? So the data in a hotel management system is fairly specific to a geography. So all the hotels in let's say India can be you know separated from all the hotels in US. Similarly, all the rooms, all the bookings are now specific to hotels and thus specific to geography. So we could kind of bifurcate the data as per geography, right? Which gives us the leverage to divide the system into two halves, right? Now what will happen here? Now let's just say DC1 is the primary in this region and DC3 is the primary in R2. Okay. Now if DC1 goes down, all the data in DC1 is getting replicated to DC2 in near real time. So if that goes down, DC2 can become active. And all the clients who are connecting to DC1, how will they connect? So there will be a bunch of clients who are connecting via some DNS to DC1. Right? If this goes down, DNS can flip and connect to DC2 if this link is broken. Right? Similar thing can happen on this side. So this way what we have is uh, basically dividing our infrastructure into two halves. Thereby clients who are closer to this region are connecting to the servers that are closer to them, thus giving them lower latency. Right? Now we could go even one step further. We could say that we'll divide the region into four parts. And we could do, we could go as much as deep we want into this to increase the latency, basically to reduce the latency and increase the availability. But I think for all practical purposes, at least for a hotel management system, this R1, R2 thing is more than sufficient to give us a good enough latency and a very high availability. So I think, yeah, that should be it for a hotel management system. Thanks for watching this video. If you have any suggestions on what we, videos we should make next or how we could improve this one, do let us know by commenting here. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel and share the videos with your friends while we keep bringing you more such content. Happy learning!